So the question is, is can, um, oh, I see I have a typo here already. Can, can collective impact um, uh, help society's complex problems? And um, the, the question is, what is collective impact? So we need to do some background work on this um, and uh, then we'll, we'll start applying it more toward, toward what you're doing. So collective impact is a methodology of, of helping organizations come together to solve complex social problems. And there is a, an article that appeared Actually, it was a series of articles that appeared in around 2012 in the academic journal called the Stanford Social Innovation Review, Stanford University Social Innovation Review. And collective impact had been going before that, but that, that series of articles really put it on the map. And there are a number of collective impact initiatives now going on around the world, and I will describe some of them to give you an idea as to how it can be related to food. Before we get there, um, so many of you may have heard of the term VUCA, which stands for volatility, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world that we live in. And that calls for special ways of thinking that we're not used to, stuff that we didn't learn in school. Um, and so we're, we're, we need collective impact to deal with complex VUCA uh, situations in our society. And there's all sorts of um, um, indicators about how much more complex and volatile the world is getting besides the virus. Um, for instance, if you look at the, the amount of data generated by humanity in the last two or three years, it's equal to the amount of data it was generated by humanity in our entire 200,000 year history beforehand. So that's, that's one way in which uh, complexity is increasing very rapidly. I'll just mention two sorts of frameworks. Many of you have probably heard of Kinefin by a man named Snowden. I'll look at another one in a moment. Um, he talks about uh, how if you have, um, um, a, a relatively simple situation, you sense, you categorize, and you respond, and you will find best practices. Like, I have a favorite recipe for pancakes. That's a pretty simple um, thing to solve, is how to make good pancakes. Complicated, um, you, you're, you're going to probably need to get an expert for that. If you are trying to troubleshoot an airliner that just came in and there's some funky thing happening, there at the airport, you're going to need to have an expert that goes in and senses and analyzes rather than categorizing and responds to the problem. It's a system, although very complicated, it's still, you still have cause and effect at, 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 uh, at hand. If you go into complexity, cause and effect goes away. You cannot be sure what's going on. You can only um, uh, perceive it in retrospect. You can, you can perceive patterns. If you can really understand what's going on, that it goes back into a complicated situation, but you really are stuck with having to probe. And we'll talk about what a probe is in a minute, sense and respond to try to see the patterns and then see what you do about the patterns. Uh, novel practice. So this is when it's chaotic. Um, the building is burning, you act and then figure out what, what sense you can make of it later. We won't go there, but it's interesting to note that um, the way this is drawn, there is a special, whoops, let me go back here. There's a special relationship, although this drawing doesn't show it exactly, between simple and chaotic. You can think, think, think things are very simple and suddenly you have chaos. So it can go falling back that way chaos can, can emerge into complex situations and so forth. Um, so what we're gonna be talking, the, the um, um, uh, collective impact is a, is a system for dealing with complex situations. It's a complexity tool. 
There's another view of complexity by a theorist called Stacy that I actually prefer to Snowden. Um, although the reading is extremely difficult. It's one of these things where you, you read a page and then you read the next page and then you go back and read the first page again and then you go back to the page before that and read it again so you can figure out what he's talking about. But he does end up saying that complexity is, oh, I keep getting, it's jumping back and forth. Uh, complexity is what happens when people talk together. And that they can deal with it. They can get results that transform their problem, give them new frameworks, most consistently when they're talking together and they do what's called reflexive inquiry, which is thinking about how we're thinking. And uh, that often leads you to what's called transformative learning, which is learning where you see a different framework rather than adding more information. Um, I've got an exercise, for example, uh, that if you can use your imagination with me when I'm teaching the difference between a hierarchy and circles, I'll first line everybody up in, in rows like the military and I'll uh, have each row facing me and I'll say, all right, take a step to the right and everybody takes a step to the right and take a step backwards and so I can move them very efficiently then I'll have them curl the lines around and form circles and we form a general circle out of those. And I have everybody kind of hold hands around and I tell them to step back and we step back and we see that actually everybody is in a great big circle. Uh, having a circle structure is just ways of, of pinching the great big circle. We're all equivalent in this big circle. And then I'll say, everybody take a step to the left. And of course the circle just starts turning. Nobody's moving anywhere, we're not moving it. It's, you cannot give a, uh, a direction um, to everybody, like how you should step in order to go one step that way. However, if you transform everybody's framework and say, you see the sun over there, it's in the South. I want you to move one half of a meter to the east and now they can do it they can do it because you give them a different framework and that framework looking at things in a different framework is often what we need in order to solve problems in order to see what the pattern is in order to move together so that's another view of complexity complexity uh, is striving to get to look at things with a different a different framework and that can let you actually deal better with it. So linear processes are for solving complicated problems. Um, if you, this is not what agile people do because agile is a way of developing software and software turns out to be complex because it involves um, things that you can't specify, which is like what people actually need. So you can have a nice waterfall program, this is called here, where you, you plan and you execute things. And this is, I've managed big projects using this kind of linear process, but it's when everything is pretty well, pretty well known and you can, you can engineer it. That's the process that you use. Food, the things needing um, uh, like a food system that is, is very complex cannot be solved. If you have food deserts somewhere, you cannot simply sit down and come up with a project plan that's going to solve those, that's those food desert problems. For that, you need uh, nonlinear processes. You need to um, uh, evaluate. This is one way of saying it. There's other ways of drawing this circle. What's going on? Let's have some reflexive inquiry and thinking about, hmm, what if we do this? And let's do an experiment. And then based on the experiment, we can say, well, there's a pattern here. We might get over here. And if we change this a little bit, then we get more satisfaction out of everybody. So adjust and correct um, uh, is impossible or is, is when it's impossible to do predicting control to solve a problem. Okay then you need to move to nonlinear uh, processes. Um, 
let me stop just for a minute. Is this, is anybody like lost here? Am I going too fast? Is this making any sense? I can't see everybody when I'm on screen share. So, and I can't really see my chat. Um, unless, oh, maybe if I go over here, I can see chat. Um, yeah, I'm, I think people are following. Yep. Okay. I think, good. yeah. It's, it's hard when you're doing this it on is. your computer, you can't see anybody. So thank you. Making sense. Thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. So, um, you need governance networks to address wicked problems. Um, you can have all kinds of complexity. You can have complexity in things. You can have complexity in planning and you can have totally screwed up institutions that are just not functioning, uh, which is one of the things that we have happening in the world today. We have a, a um, deterioration in our old familiar institutions, uh, particularly if you're living in the US and wondering if there's gonna be a civil war next week. Um, and so governance networks are, uh, are able to address all these things if they're done properly, if they're done uh, where everybody's getting a chance to think together and think about how they're thinking together. So that's how we get into collective impact networks. Um, there's some nice um, writings about this, about collective impact besides the um, uh, uh, was that the, the the articles that appeared in the Stanford Social Innovation Review about uh, collective impact? Um, we just talked about uh, opening our minds to being able to challenge our assumptions. It's one thing that's needed to transform a system. Um, doing good collective, uh, or excuse me, emotional intelligence that really helps too. Um, so that you can hear each other. There's a lot of methodologies for really doing that. Some people like, for instance, uh, nonviolent communication. I, I even better like uh, something called Imago, uh, safe conversations is related to using couples therapy. It's a very powerful uh, listening process. And then opening the will, um, letting go of preset goals and agendas to see what's really needed and, poss and possible. I'm gonna tell you a little story here right now. I call this opening the will. I call it having or letting go of a hummingbird mind. And here's the story about the hummingbird. Uh, we have, we're fortunate enough to have a screened in porch in the back of our house. And it, uh, it faces some woods and there is a screen door that is at the north end of this porch um, and then the, the, all the way around is just screening. And I, uh, about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, my wife let out a holler. But we've had birds get trapped in this porch before. It hadn't been any couple of months. She let out a holler. There's a hummingbird trapped on our porch. And so I went out, I took a look at it, and here was this poor hummingbird who was, uh, now here's the north end here. He was smacking on the other side of the porch, hitting his head against the screen. So I got my, my sweatshirt out and I tried to wave him back and he went back a few feet and then he went around me and just banging into the end of the porch. And then I went and got a broom and I was able to nudge him back to just about midway where there was a, a peak and, and he kept going around the broom but I pushed back more on him and he finally, went and, and, and settled on the very peak of the roof. And we have some like Christmas tree lights around there. So I turned them on, maybe try to encourage him to be moving. But I, we then called the neighbors up and said, does anybody have a minnow net or a, a butterfly net? And finally somebody did show up with a little net about this big for catching minnows. My idea was to see if I could catch him in that in order to get him off the porch. And so I went back out there and he had actually moved from the his perch up there and he was on the, the blade of the fan and something happened. He was so upset that I heard him chirp. Have you ever heard a hummingbird make a peep or a chirp, a sound of any sort before? I had not. This was one very upset hummingbird. 
So I held the net up close to the edge of the, the fan and I thought, oh, I'm gonna catch him. Instead, he climbed right on the edge of the net and he looked very bedraggled, a very unhappy hummingbird. So I carried him out through the door and carried him outside and kind of flipped, flipped the net and suddenly he took off just as fast as the hummingbird could fly, heading south, just as fast as he could go. And then I understood what was going on. That hummingbird probably had magnetic uh, uh, particles in his brain and that was telling him, and he also knew that fall was coming. And so he needed to go south. And the hummingbird mind said, go south. It doesn't matter what you do, go south. And that's called, as we say here, a preset goal or an agenda. And he was not able to let go of that for even a moment to be able to go north a little bit in order to go south. He's primed to be in the woods. You can go around any tree in the woods, but he was not in the woods. He was in a new situation. So opening the will, if you have a hummingbird mind, which really all of us do in some way, makes it very difficult to do this. And being even aware of the preset goals that you have so that you can step back from those is a key to dealing with complexity and, and uh, transforming situations and structures. So this talks, there's a word about blind spots here. There are often rigid assumptions and agendas and fa we fail to see that transforming systems is ultimately about transforming relationships among those who shape the systems. Uh, so the porch we have in this case is not uh, my physical porch in the backyard. It's the way we're relating to each other. It looks like we always have to do that, but it's not so. Okay. So collective impact uh, methodology um, is a strategy to nurture and perhaps transform networks. You need a common agenda. So um, let's say that we, we were, uh, we have an example of we're going to do permaculture in our co-housing community. That's our common agenda. We're going to uh, do, do incredible um, uh, growing of things on a fifth of an acre, and we're gonna get two metric tons of food out of it, I saw Graham Bell, who I had the, uh, who's the, was involved with the Scottish Permaculture Association. Please say hi to him if he's, if you see him. He he was getting two metric tons out of a fifth of an acre. If that if we're doing it together, not just in our backyard, and that's our common agenda. We need a shared measurement system, and I'm going to give I'm going to just go through those in a minute and give you an example of how this works in a more of a social situation. And we'll go back to permaculture in a minute. So everybody in the system has to know whether you're succeeding or not. Uh, you need reach, mutually reinforcing activities. So if you've got a permaculture garden back there, everybody needs to be doing something that's according to, um, if it's not a plan, it's a, an understanding of, of what we need to be doing. It needs to be continuous communication. That's not always easy. I couldn't communicate with that hummingbird very well. Um, and and uh, the, the, it means keeping records, all sorts of things. And then critically, you need something called a backbone organization. A backbone organization supplies the administrative support for the system to operate. And it turns out, as we'll look at in a minute, that having a backbone organization for your network is very critical. Um, a backbone organization typically doesn't run things, but it makes sure that um, records are kept, the, um, the website's up, um, the, um, the, the people who are doing something who have to be paid, get paid, all that kind of thing. So just a story to, to, to illustrate these points. Uh, one of the early collective impact network, or excuse me, collective impact council efforts uh, that was recounted in the Stanford Social Innovation Review articles was the um, uh, case of a town in Connecticut, in the US. Uh, it's a state in the US and in, in New England um, where they were having a really bad problem with the teenagers drinking. 
And so they got together a collective impact council and now had to coordinate several institutions in the town. So the police showed up, uh, representatives of school guidance counselors showed up, psychiatrists showed up, parent societies show up, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and so forth. And they said, we got to solve the teenage drinking problem. There's lots of kids in a lot of trouble in this town. The next thing they figured out is that they all had different ways of telling whether a teenager was in trouble with alcohol. The police had one, the psychiatrist had one, school guidance counselors had another, Alcoholics Anonymous had another. So they they quickly as they could came up with one way of measuring if a kid was in trouble. So if the police picked up a kid who was staggering down the street, they could check off. This is exactly what we found and that could, could get handed over to whoever was gonna be um, giving uh, help to this kid. And they would have, they would know exactly what was going on. The police needed to coordinate with the schools, with Alcoholics Anonymous. They all, if, a, if any kid was picked up by the police, Everybody got notified if the school guidance counselor was worried about a child or the, the parents, they would put the uh, the word out in the system and everybody would know uh, uh, what, you know, when they dealt with this child, what was going on so they could reinforce each other. Uh, continuous communication, they had really special um, internet communication channels. So I think, I think actually it was a, it was a WhatsApp channel, but they had special groups and um, they, everybody was taught exactly how to use them. Uh, and then the backbone organization was, um, I, I believe it was the uh, one of the social services in the um, city government that was actually providing the backbone services. And they were right there. They had everybody show up to meetings on time, had lots of follow through. They did a really good job. And guess what? Within the space of several months, they brought the teenage drinking problem uh, down a lot. It really came much more under control. And that the kind of coordination that happened continued to, to maintain a, uh, a much safer, uh, uh, healthier environment. So that was an example, a nice dramatic example of a collective impact strategy, collective impact council, coordinating disparate organizations and bringing them together to solve common complex problem. So now let's go to something involving food. This is where permaculture starts to be involved. If you can think of permaculture not as what you're doing in the back of your co-housing community or a small area, but start thinking of permaculture as something that may um, cover hundreds of square kilometers, vast areas. That's, think of that from a permaculture standpoint. And you now have lots of uh, environmental and, and ecological system problems to solve. The Appalachian Food Shed Project was started by the um, um, uh, Department of Agriculture there's this link, when you get the slides, this link will take you back to that. And now let's hope that I didn't get myself out of the picture here. I've got to go back into, okay, I was afraid of that. If I hopped away on a strange computer, bear with me a minute. I was just illustrating that we have a, um, John, as you're doing that, just checking in, um, like, um, this is so interesting, but also just checking the time remaining, like. Right, I, I think I have 15 more minutes, is that right? Got it, okay. Yes, we're okay. saying yes, cool, uh, thank you. I don't know what to do about this here, let's see. Let's try doing this. Okay, there it is, I think. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead with this, uh, putting up with this thing on the right hand side. Remember, okay. it's in your Zoom. Is it not Zoom, John? In your it, Zoom and then share. It, it is sharing right now. Can everybody see the slide? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So 
the the Appalachian Food Shed project went on for five years. Uh, it was very um, uh, vast. It was a vast project. There were they set up local food councils. Those food councils set representatives to state, uh, or at least part of partial of state uh, food councils. The uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina were all involved, and. Um, those state food councils or, or regional food councils then set representatives to the University of Virginia where there was a, a department there that was running, was playing the backbone uh, structure for this organization. And the food councils, we taught them how to use sociocracy. Uh, there's some nice dramatic stories around that. Um, and they then talked about the, the lessons they learned. They said, uh, over this five-year period, they learned about the need for diversity of, of voices, that they needed to use consent in the decision-making process for these food councils. The food councils typically consisted of everybody who had anything to do with the with the food um, service, uh, uh, you know, like trucking companies, grocery stores, food banks, uh, farmers. And, you know, as many as 50 or 60 organizations were involved in these food councils. Um, the, we talked about experimenting and retooling, uh, that the process is rhizomal, not tree-like. In other words, it's, there's a, it's a network system. It's not distinct entities that you need to expect emergence when you go into a, a system like that, make lots of alliances um, and have a network mindset. Uh, figure you're going to change as well as everybody else. So the, I wanted to make sure you knew that this, uh, you can get this link here to this. It's a really interesting report that they did after the five-year project. The money ran out after five years and the project, because it didn't have the backbone organization, has gradually dissolved. It's become other things. It did not continue on. And so it illustrates the importance of a backbone organization. There's another link here to something called the Latrobe Valley Food Security Coalition, which is in Australia. They talk about a collective impact to deal with food security. And um, in this case, they seem to have a much better um, uh, organization providing the backbone structure, and they seem to be going on pretty well. Um, their goal was to reduce the 6.6% of the population in Victoria State and Australia uh, back to about the 3% level, which is uh, uh, the, the, the particular town they were in was much higher uh, in the Latrobe Valley than it is in the overall Victoria State. Well, that's a problem and it's really valuable. Um, I'm going to take the risk of going off again because now I want to talk about how important it is, I think, to take a, a fast area approach to permaculture because I want to just underline the, the, just the, the challenge that we're now facing, the disaster that's about to strike. You remember in the early days of COVID, you maybe heard about this virus in China, and that was January. And then there were a couple of little cases coming in February, and then suddenly it exploded. Well, we're in the February timeframe of the world hunger crisis right now. This is the world meter The current world population is expanding that fast. We have 7 billion people. The amount the, the net population growth this year alone is 65 million people. Um, if you look here, um, uh, the to some of these other things in the environment, this is the number of forest hectares lost this year. This is the amount of land lost to soil erosion. And this is the rate at which the land and the earth is turning to desert this year, 9 million hectares. So you've got the population exploding and you've got the amount of arable land going down. And you have nearly 
Well, you have more than three quarters of a billion people who are undernourished in the world today. And the number of people who died today from hunger is approaching 20,000. It'll probably approach 25,000 people who died of hunger today. And that's the food problem that we're facing on the planet. And we need to bring all of our wisdom, all of everything we can. And I think permaculture has a lot to offer here to think about how do we get food to everybody while we're trying to solve the population explosion problem. And that's the challenge that I offer you is to think much bigger than just a lot small area that you're doing permaculture in and thinking, how do we bring permaculture concepts to the whole planet? If not the whole planet, at least you know broad areas of the world. Um, the collective impact and food systems management is still a very new topic. It's not been done very much. The Appalachian Food Shed Project is one of the rarer ones that I'm aware of. Um, and I, this is a quote from the Appalachian Food Shed Project report. Um, it says that, our, um, I, actually, I'm sorry, it's another academic paper. If you want to look at, in general, what people are thinking about collective impact and food systems, they're saying that um, only if you have a lead organization, this, this backbone organization that can build trust relationships, does this work at all? And in fact, they say that Collective impact is not the complete answer. In their experience, it doesn't really completely work. So collective impact is, is a tool, but it's not the perfect tool. It, it's got some problems, particularly in the, in the um, uh, backbone structure, but the, they, they tend to not last. They tend to not go into place and really become the institutions that we need uh, to really solve the problem. So it's probably, solutions are probably beyond collective impact. And so I um, had thought that we might try to break into small working groups here to um, get you to just think about what would be a, a, a something that you might do as a collective impact, permaculture collective impact initiative around food in a large regional area. Since we don't have time to do that, I would like you to take a moment, take a breath, think about it a minute, and just jot down some ideas as to what would a project be like in the area that you're familiar with that would go beyond just your permaculture uh, controlled farm into trying to bring permaculture principles to your state, your town, your valley, wherever you're living, how would you approach that? How would you get all the different people in your valley together to take a permaculture approach to, to making sure that everybody has food? And even how do you take an approach to starting to get people to control the population? So, and it can be just in your valley, your area. So please take a few moments and then we'll, we'll get you to um, uh, put some of your thoughts in and then I'm gonna give you, uh, conclude this with one thought that I have. So um, please go ahead and do that and I'll be, I'll watch the, the chat here for a few moments and we'll see what, what you come up with. The, um, the person who wrote uh, Sheep, it says, radical resilience. Could you put another sentence about what's radical resilience? Uh, that sounds interesting. Fascinating, Henny, if you have any links 
that we could let us hear about Alto Paraiso, that would be great. Water farming. Mm -hmm. Yes, urban gardening. Hang your garden out your window. Uh, and then, of course, if you do that, there's the problem of how to get it to the homeless people that are out there below the window. We don't have any resources. How do you distribute this food? Nice, nice mobilizing women. Bidding projects on a municipal scale, what's achievable through conscious design. Nice, you bring the city into it, very important. Um, yes, the, and there's still food deserts in Appalachia. Saw the Appalachian comment. Teach school children, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I'm very moved by the comment of taking homeless into your homes. I, I want to honor um, Lorene's reminder of the that we want to have some discussion time. This last picture, speaking of children, is a picture of a children's parliament gathering in a school in India. These children are not gathered by grade, they're gathered by the neighborhood they live in. And they're talking about uh, dealing with neighborhood problems and they send representatives to larger federations and they are federated up so that there's a, a parliament of the, of the county, the Panjayat, you can call it, of the Indian state. And there's even a, uh, prime child prime minister of india and it seems like the children are capable of solving problems in some ways better than adults these children have solved they're here have solved all kinds of problems of that social workers haven't been able to solve like child marriage problems and all that kind of thing taking care of elderly in the in the village and um, i don't know if they've actually tried to tackle food supply so organizing the children is certainly what I would have put in the in the chat. Um, so that that's the end of my presentation for today. I will get out of screen share here, and let's have some some thoughts, some reflections. Let me turn it over to Maureen. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock and we have 15 minutes left. Am I getting this? So um, I think John is opening for some questions about what he, like the, the prompts you've given us. And that was rich, John. So just thank you. Very rich. Um, and what gets stirred in the chat. I see people saying, yay. So just yay for John. <laughs> like, yay. Um, and lots of rich discussion in the chat. Um, so maybe one or two, like maybe we could spend maybe um, two or three minutes, John, and like specific reactions here. And I think a lot of them are in the chats, um, but then maybe moving into a meta reflection that we come into the space together. Some of us knew each other, some of us didn't, and we've been on a four hour journey. So, uh, I mean, John, may I ask you, like, is it okay if we move, like zoom out to the four full hours? Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Go for it. Yep. Thank you, okay. Um, so maybe just taking a second, um, like, whew, people might be tired for hours. Thank you, everyone. It's a lot of attention and time. So thanks for everyone for your energy and focus. Um, lots of rich resources. Maybe just taking a minute to just think about everything that has been stirred for you. And then maybe thinking, I'm going to put a prompt in the chat, which is like, what now moving forward? What do you like, you know, we've kind of looked at the um, ecosystem between permaculture and sociocracy, and that's a place right for innovation. Um, and we have now an idea of um, collective impact, but just, and then there's just you in your life. So like, we've got the meta level, and we've got the level of specificity of you and your personal lives, but just what now moving forward? Is there anything that you need that like thinking to the group, like just a little wish list, like, I wish this or that, 
And then is there anything like, my gosh, I would do this if someone just gave me the chance. So maybe just taking a second to think of these thoughts and then please um, respond in the chat. And is less around, who's less? And people are starting to enter things in the richness of the edge between the two systems are inspiring. Thank you for this time and audio recorded as well as a video if you're listening. Have space to practice, community of practice, active experimentation. I've heard that in several spaces, so just amplifying that echo there. So I see Kathy talking about wanting to bring this into her sphere of influence. Yeah, how it would make a huge difference to how we interact. So less than the um, permaculture circle team, I would encourage you to speak up like using this, like people are saying stuff and you kind of have ideas of what's in the works and what's possible. So I actually am just gonna like turn this over to you guys to weave the threads that are emerging. Yeah, um, I'll speak up and uh, anyone from the circle can, can speak up as well. And just say there's so many things coming together. There's so much good effort in the world that people are already engaged in and uh, building those relationships. So we really, we want you to have this recording, you know, to take this work with you, to access that Miro board that we've been creating together. We'll be reviewing that as a circle. We want to invite you into, um, you know, Sociocracy for All to take a course, you know, wherever you can find one that makes sense for you and to be in contact with us as the permaculture circle. And I will put a, an email that comes to the entire circle um, into the chat in a minute. And yeah, there's, there are lots of ways to learn. I was going to invite, I think Ted is back with us to um, share opportunities for engagement. And, um, and then if other members of the circle want to, to share. So you might know Sociocracy for All is a membership organization. So we have about 160 something members right now in all kinds of circles. So that's if you're looking for exposure to other people who do this kind of stuff, that's a great way. And I find that doing things together is a great way to bond in particular. So there are all kinds of circles. And I'll throw the link to our organizational structure in the chat. Um, also, one thing that is good for learning is one particular kind of training that we have because it's so easy to decentralize. And it's, oh, that's what I put in the chat just now is um, ELC, Empowered Learning Circle, which is a set of videos that people can just um, take as a small group and watch. And then it basically walks you through some presentation and exercises that you can do with your group there. So you ideally do it in a group of between five and six or maybe seven people so that you really have that small group experience. So that's something that's easy to do as a first step and anything that the others mentioned now. Heck. So here's the uh, permaculture at Sociocracy for All that comes to the circle members. So if you wanted to reach out to us and um, perhaps I can trade off to, I'm seeing Henny smiling and then Andreas, um, if you want to share. Yeah, just, just, I would like just to, to, to express my gratitude and my happiness 
It's been a lovely afternoon. It took us a lot of work to organize that. But I really want to, you know, like put all like my applauses to Rhonda, who, you know, carried us throughout this process with such care, you know, being our operational leader in this process and putting us together to work. It's been like the first of many to go events that we are plan organizing. We are planning on organizing a course on both connections, sociocracy and permaculture for next year. So we're gonna have like more time and um, appropriate, you know, connections and um, to, to discuss and to, you know, integrate all thoughts together. So I'd like also to thank, you know, each of the presenters, John Buck, it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you here, John Schinnerer, Andreas, Les, Lorreen, you know, like everybody that, that made a part of this um, afternoon together. Thanks a lot. I had a lovely time. Yeah, and I would like to say just a few words that um, uh, I feel really um, thankful for seeing all these faces and uh, it makes me think that, you know, we have we have momentum we just need to channel it and uh, this is what we're aiming for. So really grateful to see all these motivated faces and see you again. And also big thanks to Loreen and Rhonda. Um, Les, are you in a place to speak to the group? And then Laureen, um, perhaps we can get a closing thought from John Schinner and John Buck. You with us? Okay, go to Laureen. Um, I mean, I would just echo the gratitude that's been said for the permaculture circle like this um, has been an evolution in the making. Um, and it's beautiful what is being made so just and for everybody who's like it's almost like a snowball and like all the extra snow that's getting packed in like I do feel like momentum. And John, I feel like you gave an image of some place to go to, like that um, we're better together. So just, it's exciting what's growing here. And Ted and Jerry for um, tech support and everything else, um, but getting linked in um, to especially the Empowered Learning Circle, it's a great way to get groups of people started together. Thank you. With, I would just invite, if this is completely spontaneous, John Schinner and John Buck, either of you have any words in the circle as a presenter now? Go ahead, John. No, go ahead, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Um, yeah, well, uh, obviously, echo all the appreciations of the Permaculture Circle, everybody who showed up, because without participation, there isn't an event. Um, the organizers, my fellow presenters, and um, just to say, those of you who were in my thing, you know, it's like sooner or later, it all comes down to human relatings. So how we how we work together or not is a really prime determiner of our outcome. So just carry that thought with you and, and observe, observe, observe how we do that. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, being invited to, to speak today. And Lorene, thank you for the suggestion as to what to talk about. Um, I myself could learn a lot more about permaculture. I, I'm aware of the principles somewhat. Uh, I am aware that it's a very important way of thinking about our environment. And as I said in my presentation, I encourage you to think big because we need your big thoughts. Yeah, and yay, and to Rakesh too just gratitudes and do you have any any closing thoughts Rakesh a word uh only just to say thank you for everyone uh we know how strong permaculture is we know how strong sociocracy is and wherever you're putting your energy just keep putting that love and that energy into it and just make it beautiful and if we can bring the two together why not let's do it together but just keep doing what you're doing <clears throat> let's make this world a beautiful place thank you very much everyone yeah
Yeah. Woohoo. I'm, I'm just celebrating. Thank I'm so <laughs> thankful to everyone and, you know, grateful, wanting to stay connected, wanting to see the, the networks and the synergies and that flow of energy and ideas and information that can be an effective leverage point everywhere get stronger and stronger. So thank you so very, very much. We're actually going to close a little bit early, although we'll stay on for a while to um, interact and, and enjoy any conversations in the chat. And thank you so very, very much to my, my fellow permaculture circle, to all the guest presenters and to Sociocracy for All in the technical support and structure to make all of this happen. So thank you very much. Much gratitude. Yay, celebrations.